Formula One, Rally, and Endurance Racing. In the 1980s, they all had something in common. They were all completely unhinged. It was the typical 1980s. Total excess, because we can. Rally's Group B era was a period of total engineered insanity. Road cars turned into homologation specials and then blitzed through the mountain roads of Monte Carlo, the deserts of Kenya, the snowy tracks of Sweden, the muddy quagmires of Wales and everywhere in between. Stories of fans being so exuberant trying to touch the cars as they went by, that fingers were found in the intakes of Integrali S4s and the homologation specials being so over the top that somewhere out there is a mid-engined 205 GTI. Well, a 205 T16 before the Anoraks turn up. I know you're out there. But Group B came to a sudden and tragic end in 1986 when Henry Teuvenen went off the side of a steep bank at the Tour de Corsa and the car burst into flames. The cause of the crash is still up in the air. Mechanical failure, fatigue from driving that sort of car for hundreds of miles a day on those roads at those speeds, blackout from a combination of the heat and the fact that Teuvenen was recovering from the flu, the list goes on. Now over in Formula 1, they had two mental eras in succession. Ground Effect was gone for 1983, thanks in part to the deaths of Gilles Villeneuve and Riccardo Paletti, the latter death being, ironically, at the circuit now named in Villeneuve's memory. And also in there is the career-ending injuries of Didier Peroni at Hockenheim, when he smashed into the back of Alain Prost Renault in the rain that was, in another case of irony, almost a carbon copy of how Villeneuve was killed at Zolder mere months before. After Ground Effect went, the turbo's power in the cars became more and more powerful. By 1986, the BMW inline 4 in the Brabham cars was rumoured to be pumping out 1,200 horsepower in full qualifying party mode, making it the world's fastest hand grenade, at least on a circuit before someone mentions top fuel dragsters. Those engines were good for about 15 miles before they were chucked in the bin, and they also had to design special gearboxes to handle that amount of power. It also has to be said here that I'm giving 1,400 horsepower as a loose figure here. As I've said multiple times when talking about this BMW engine, the horsepower figure seems to go up by 1 or 200 horsepower every 5 years or so. Either way, after 1986, turbos were turned down slowly until 1988, after which they were dumped and the 3.5 litre formula was introduced. Now hold on to that thought for a second. But this story concerns Group C, the ultra popular endurance category from the 1980s that outlasted Group B and Formula 1's turbo era. There has been a little bit of a revival thanks to the hypercar category or GTP if you watch IMSA that will be at Le Mans later this year for the 100th anniversary. And really this video concerns the downfall of Group C because, well it's a little more than just this or just that. Group C had one sort of main rule if you could call it that. As long as you meet fuel consumption numbers, anything goes in terms of the engine you run. Turbocharged V8? Sure. Naturally aspirated V12? Go for it. Buy Turbo H16? <laughs> if you can make it work, knock yourself out, sunshine. It was designed in such a way that manufacturers could run their engines, if that makes any sense. Because different manufacturers have a signature engine, for want of a better phrase. Porsche, Flat 6, Aston and Jaguar were running V12s back then, Ford with a V8, and yes, Mazda with their rotary. The engineering arms race created by Group C started to result in top speeds nudging 240 miles an hour on Le Mans' 3.5 mile Mulsanne Strait. Sorry, the Hune d'Air. Either way, speeds were approaching warp 10, with Peugeot building a car for no other reason than to break the 400 km an hour mark, or 250 miles an hour for those of us that still insist on using old money. Today is decimal day, conveniently. Peugeot broke the barrier with a clock speed of 407, declared it as 405, and used it to mark the road car that had the same name, the 405. It was the peak of popularity and how far can we push this? A comparison I like to use here on the channel, and I know I've said this a million times, but if you're new here, I'll say it again, I like to compare it to the Attitude Era of professional wrestling. To make it more motorsport friendly, think of it like the BTCC in the 90s. If there was a car company that sold cars in Britain in the 90s, chances are it had a full up works entry in the British Touring Car Championship. Likewise, if there was a sports car company, chances are it had a car in a Group C event. Well, the major ones anyway, some exceptions. Now this is where that 3.5 litre engine formula for 1989 in Formula 1 comes back round again. The FIA also shortened the race distances to make them more of a 
but we'll call them a sprint race to try and bring in more TV audience that kind of annoyed some of the fans. And actually the WEC, which is the successor to the World Sports Car Championship, is thinking of bringing those back, those shorter races, to bring in some more TV revenue and make it a bit more TV friendly. But either way, the new engine rule was simple. 3.5 litre displacement, or capacity, whichever, and it can be V8, V10, or V12. So this pushed out the things like the rotary and also the turbos. The Mazda actually exploited a loophole in the 1991 Le Mans regulations to be able to run that rotary, while everybody else had to turn their turbos down. That car was not banned for being too fast. It was always going to be banned. Well, at least the rotary was. This rule change was announced in 1988 by FIA President Jean-Marie Balestri and was all part of a plan to unify the FIA's top category open wheel and sports car series and create crossovers so teams and manufacturers could race in both. 3.5 litre engines in Formula 1, 3.5 litre engines in endurance racing. A plan that was actually pushed for by Max Mosley, or at least suggested by Max Mosley, who was working for the FIA at the time. Plan being that both series were going to grow together as a result. It works in Formula 1, why not have it work in endurance racing too? But while it looked like a good idea on paper, there were two things holding that plan back. One on the economic front for teams and event organisers, and the other on the engineering front. Now firstly, the ticket prices went through the roof for sports car events. The organisers of the races were being charged way more than before and TV broadcasts were pretty much disappearing. In return though, the Japanese manufacturers were lured in, which added some strength and names to the entry lists. But because the races got shortened down to effectively be sprint races, like I've said, much like what the WEC is thinking of doing to attract a bigger audience, killed off a lot of what made those events special to start with. Because winning a 1000 km race holds more for a team, because the car did 1000 kilometers. The fans hated this new sprint race format. They wanted the races to be longer, and they protested by having these banners lining the circuits telling the FIA how much they didn't like it. The new engine formula didn't help things either because those same fans were watching and this is something that's going to come up more than a few times, well, it's probably going to come up twice over the next few minutes, and that is basically, why don't we just do X if we're just going to do Y? On the mechanical front, if you had a Formula 1 team already, you were okay. You could take a Formula 1 engine and drop it into your Group C car. If you didn't have a Formula 1 team, which well, none of them did, it would be a very expensive prospect to build an engine from the ground up, and build a new car for it to go in, as the existing chassis were designed around a totally different engine. That last point isn't strictly true, because Porsche was supplying engines to footwork around the start of the 1990s, so they took that engine out of that footwork, put it in their own car, and found it to just be rubbish. So they just went, yeah, there's really no point in spending money on this. We're not really in the best financial shape right now. So they just walked away from endurance racing altogether. The other problem was, while the FIA thought you could just drop an engine into a Group C car, you can't just drop a Formula 1 engine into a Group C car. Formula 1 engines at that time were designed to run for about 250 miles, not 24 hours. All the power was also produced at high RPM, so the manufacturers would have to somehow engineer those engines to produce all the power they needed at a lower RPM level. This was pointed out by a Reddit article I found by someone calling themselves the Cookie Monster. In addition, the turbos would be phased out, and rotaries for that matter, which really annoyed the bosses at Mazda. When a couple of the top drivers expressed their concerns about this engine switch, Balestri slammed them, saying something to the effect of, you are just drivers, you have no business speaking up, Basically, the whole thing was done as a, a press conference. I probably should have mentioned this. As well as this, a guy called Bernard Cahier, I think I've pronounced that correctly, did speak up to Balestri and said, well, are the team owners going to have a say in this? Balestri said, no. Cahier, you are a well-known troublemaker. This is my press conference. You have the next two days to ask their opinions, so do it then. It's also said in that extended quote that Mosley himself was pretty annoyed by this whole the only decision is my decision thing. But what happened was this new rule pushed out Porsche. Porsche was the draw for that era, and when Porsche left the World Sports Car Championship, now the WEC, the fans went too. Now you might think I'm talking rubbish here, but when Porsche came back to Le Mans with the 919 in 2014, the attendance at Le Mans was the highest since 1988. Their turbos were now obsolete, 
and those using customer cars and power plants were left with substandard engines that gave substandard results. So not only are the manufacturers going to have to design new cars and new engines at high cost, the privateers will have to buy new kit at high cost to be able to remain competitive. All that remained for the 1992 World Sports Car Championship were five manufacturer teams and six privateers, and the chatter amongst them must have gone to the effect of, you know there's this little Irish bloke, he's just done his first season in Formula 1, got fifth in the constructors, spent 12 million to do it. 12 million dollars over 16 races for fifth in the constructors. We're spending more than that for half of the races. So... Maybe we should just go and do this whole Formula 1 thing. That was enough to make the manufacturers see that they'd get better value for money in Formula 1. The 1992 World Sports Car Championship became the Peugeot show as the Jean Todd led project basically outspent the rest of the grid. Mercedes and Jaguar were thinking it's a good thing they'd already left, because they weren't going to spend money to turn up just to be spanked by Peugeot. As it was, Mercedes and Sauber, who had gone at the end of 1991, went to Formula 1 for 1993. Peugeot were in F1 in 1994. Nissan was supposed to turn up for 1993, but the Japanese economic recession caused that project cancellation. Elsewhere, the entry list for the 1993 World Sports Car Championship was so low that the championship was cancelled outright. Only eight cars turned up to the round at Manicourt. The ACO would continue to allow detuned Group C cars to compete at Le Mans until 1994, by which point Balestri was no longer head of the FIA and had been replaced by Max Mosley, of all people, who was probably trying to mop up the absolute hurricane of piss caused by the death of Group C. But by 1997, the FIA and the SRO would have collaborated to create the FIA GT1 Championship, which then became the next beloved endurance category. The 1990 24 Hours of Le Mans was run as a non-championship round because of the squabbling between the FIA and the ACO. The FIA wanted the event on this particular date and said, this is happening. The ACO, however, is the organiser of Le Mans. It's their event. They organise it. They run it. The FIA just runs the regulations for the cars that compete at that event. The FIA also tried to install a clause that said you can only race Le Mans if you did the other rounds of that World Endurance Championship or World Sports Car Championship and also put in a massive missed event fine too. Even with Le Mans being a standalone event that year, the entry list had fewer than 30 teams on it. So Group C died with a whimper and it's interesting to see the different conclusions at play here. Some articles I've read blame Bernie because he was in charge of the commercial rights of the sports cars as well as Formula 1 at that time. Others say that Bernie wasn't wholly to blame. Some say he wasn't to blame at all. While a common theme is that it's the FIA that played a big part or a whole part, whether through power, whether through everything needs to be like F1, or just a terribly executed idea. And I'll leave a link to the Reddit article that I've mentioned a couple of times in this video so that you can go and read all of the details for yourself because it is a very detailed article that is very, very interesting to read. It's a little bit like the Colin McRae video I did on Monday. There's only one ultra detailed source of all the information and I don't want to just copy it, if you know what I mean. So I thought I'll put it in the description. You can go and read it because, well, they've done all the hard work. Cookie Monster did all the hard work. But at the end of it all, you had several things that brought it down. Costs escalating thanks to the engine change, the power exerted by Balestri, the belief of if it works here it must work there, and all of that leading to the general breakdown of trust between the FIA and the people that raced in its championship. There's a lot of stuff out there online saying that it was the FIA and or Bernie that intentionally rigged the engine regulation change in Group C to force everybody into Formula 1, because F1 is the FIA's baby and that's more important. After looking into things here, it seems that it was just a very poorly executed idea by people that thought that it was a good idea. It just seems that ideas were thrown around that had no weight in the real world. On paper, yes. In practice, no. The way Mosley thought this plan to get crossover of the two top series and increase the popularity of both, and then Balestri saying, this is happening, deal with it, crippled the relationship between the FIA and the ACO and anyone who questioned it was shut down because they weren't as powerful as Balestri, and because if you weren't as powerful as Balestri, you were below him. And personally, I see it as that badly executed idea to make endurance as popular as F1, rather than a pure power play to stop endurance being as popular as F1. 
even though it was already popular. So then this has been the story of how Group C came to a shuddering halt. If you've enjoyed this video, then do give it a thumb up so the algorithm can do its thing. And if you want to see more from this channel, get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on anything I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the people on Patreon for the support. And if you do want to support me at a more personal level to help buy up images and stuff for these videos, you can do so by clicking the link where there's also a link to the Reddit post, my Discord and also my socials. Or the super thanks if you just want to do a one-off tip. So until next time, I've been Ada Maud, have a great day wherever you are, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.